Okay, you're here, right? Well, let's assume for the sake of the conversation that you are here. Okay, my good friend, welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour, home of decent quality interviews for more than 18 years. Our special guest here is singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and mailboat records recording artist, Mac McAnally. Now, if you've been counting like Paul does, this is Mac McAnally's third interview on this show. Your host, Paul E. Leslie, considers McAnally one of the greatest purveyors of semi-true stories. Now, Mac is a man with Mississippi roots, something he shares with his longtime friend, Jimmy Buffett, who was born in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And you may remember another singer, Elvis Presley, who was also born in the Magnolia State. So this interview touches on somewhat disparate subjects like, well... Elvis Presley and his connection to Jimmy Buffett and that documentary Jazz Fest, a New Orleans story, now streaming online, by the way, that everybody's talking about. Now, Paul just won't shut up about it. Oh, 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 he loves it. Plus, some other odds and ends will be included in our interview today. McAnally has released 14 studio albums, and if you haven't seen him live, well, it may make a lifelong impression on you. We're saying that because Mac is far too humble to say it himself. He's got some solo shows throughout the year. You can catch him if you can. And he's also performing with Jimmy Buffett and the Coral Reefer Band throughout the year. Just be sure and wave at Mac when Jimmy introduces him on stage. And Mac will wave back. He always does. Well, there is a show Jimmy Buffett and the band will be doing in Antarctica this December. If Mac doesn't wait back, he's probably just cold. As always, you can support the Paul Leslie Hour by listening in, just like you are now, in yet another way, www.thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you know what to do when you're there. Oh boy, here it is, the phone ringing. Must be Mac McAnally. Paul, quick, pick up the phone. Hey, Pick up the phone now, young man. Hello? Sorry about that. I, I assumed I was getting a auto uh, warranty spam call, uh, <laughs> and I was looking for your number. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Well, Mac McAnally, how are you, sir? I am doing great. It's uh, I think they said 113 heat index in, in Nashville, but growing up in Mississippi somewhat prepared me for this. And, <laughs> I have I have an air conditioner, so it's a good day. It is a good day to have an air conditioner. I am currently on the uh, South Carolina coast, and it is it is muggy indeed. Understood. <laughs> well, thanks for taking just a few minutes for some some kind of oddball questions here. You're on break from the road for just a bit, but good to reconnect yet again. Likewise. Likewise, I I appreciate what you do. Thank you, sir. So for the uninitiated, we're talking with singer, songwriter, guitarist, pianist, record producer, inductee in the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, member of Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefer Band, Mac McAnally. And so much attention these days, 2022, has been paid to another Mississippian, we'll say, Elvis Presley, was he an influence on you vocally or in any way? Well, you know, it, more so than musically, it was really just the fact that somebody from my region made made a mark. And and it was really, and Jimmy was an influence that way as well. But Elvis, my, my hometown, Belmont, Mississippi, is it's about 45 minutes from Tupelo where Elvis was born. And it was kind of the big city. You either went to Tupelo or you went to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. I was pretty much equidistant from those two cities. Uh, and, and, you know, people from actual cities don't really call either one of those places a city, but, but it was the big city to us. And further beyond that, in a way of a connection, my aunt Maverine McAnally married Elvis's cousin, Flavus Presley. And Flavus was a truck driver that fancied himself a musician as well. And he had an old Elvis hand-me-down guitar that, that I got to 
strum around on a little bit as a kid. So, so we, we did, I did feel some measure of a connection, although I, I didn't have uh, enough confidence or, or ambition really to, to uh, aspire to, to do what he was doing. But, but the fact that somebody from, uh, as, as our song we play with Jimmy says, nobody from nowhere had amounted to something <laughs> was inspiring. And it, and it made me think that, that the hypothetical was, was possibly, uh, was, was actually possible, if that makes sense. It does, yes. So what kind of was the, uh, I guess you could say the impetus for us uh, reconnecting briefly here. I wrote this essay compiled from a lot of different sources, and it's a, an attempt to answer the question or the myth or however you want to put it. I was there at the taping of that Crossroads, Jimmy Buffett and Zach Brown Band in Franklin, Tennessee, back in, that was 2009. Right. And it's the, the origins of this story, which it's been reported in some pretty mainstream publications, that Elvis Presley intended to record Margaritaville, but never got around to it. Do you think there's any truth in that? Well, I, I have no idea whether or not it's true, but I know there are all kinds of connections. Right. You know, be it, uh, you know, Norbert obviously producing Jimmy's records and then having played on so many Elvis records. He played on a lot of Elvis records. And and Norbert and the Muscle Shoals connection is is, is a connection that to me as well. We're close friends. I'm, I'm a big fan of Norbert's. And I have learned a lot from him along the way and hope hope to learn more. But and beyond that, uh, our friend Tony Brown, who was a co-producer on the uh, on the, the two albums that Jimmy made here in Nashville in in the eighties, was uh, was the piano player for Elvis for the last several years that he was alive. And Tony has always been a, a fan of Jimmy's writing, and and, and made his mark uh, as a as a piano player with with first the Oak Ridge Boys and then Elvis. So there, there are, and the whole Memphis musician connection. There's really strong connection between Jimmy and what he did here in town, and and Elvis's camp. So it is certainly feasible that that you know that would have gotten suggested. Obviously, Elvis decided what he wanted to do ultimately, but I I don't see that as a big stretch. It's something that could have happened. I have no independent evidence that it was in progress, but it wouldn't have surprised me at all. <laughs> Very interesting. So the the myth or the uh, the the legend or whatever you want to call it will have to live on for now. <laughs> Absolutely, but uh, but he's he's always there. You know, we, uh, we well we 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 recorded Gillian Welch's Elvis Presley song, and and Jimmy did a really nice version of that. And we uh, we Jimmy and I at my place down in Muscle Shoals, La La Land, my studio down there, we. We wrote uh, Oysters and Pearls down there, and it has an Elvis verse yeah. sitting on the porch. And, 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 you know, just as far as another connection, Sam Phillips, who discovered Elvis, as far as the records are concerned, he was Sun Records in Memphis. But Sam was from Muscle Shoals, lived right there on the Tennessee River where we were sitting when we wrote Oysters and Pearls. So I, I think, you know, it, it, it's easy for a guy from Mississippi to say everything's related because pretty much everybody in Mississippi <laughs> is related. But Jimmy being a Mississippian it always meant a lot to me. Elvis being a Mississippian and having done well, as well as my uncle Flavis. And every time I tell people Flavis' name, they laugh. But, you know, when you think about it, Elvis is not a normal name. It's just a, such common knowledge in culture now that you don't think about it being an unusual name anymore because you've, you've heard it all your life. But, but Flavis, you know, he... He took me to see my first concerts in Muscle Shoals, and he was an influence on me. And they were, he and my Aunt Maverine were going to Graceland all the time, asking us to go with them. And my dad, who was like me, very bashful, said, "Oh, that fellow doesn't want to. He doesn't want a bunch of yay who's fooling with him up there. He's got a lot to do. He's a busy man." <laughs> and we just never went. So I, I never met Elvis, or never had the opportunity to see him live or at least never took advantage of the opportunity via via my dad's uh, d refusals to try. <laughs> but I am a fan, and uh, particularly that early son stuff had so much raw energy to it. And and he's had he had so much charisma that's just not containable. If you see him, you see him in a picture 
with 15 other people. At, they, they have pictures in the back of the Ryman where there's just all the stars that were there that night took a picture together. And Elvis looks like something that's photoshopped in to every picture that he's in. He just had, he just had that kind of charisma. He even shows through a black and white picture half a century later. Hmm. Very interesting. I'm glad that you mentioned that song, Oysters and Pearls. It's always uh, struck me as a, a really, I mean, it's a very deep and kind of philosophical song. Well, you know, Jimmy has a knack for that. For And and he uh, he started it because he was such a fan of, uh, he, as a pilot, he was a, he was a fan of what Lindbergh did, just take it off and flying around the world. And and so the Lindbergh verse, Jimmy pretty much came with that, and and then we're we're sitting there talking about other things that were impressive, and and I I, I just sort of rolled out the 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 Elvis verse came with me, and then we sewed it up at, at the end, and it, it really is as you say it uh, it has if you want to listen to it surface it, it, it's interesting on the surface, but if you want to go deep in there, there's some stuff in there. Oh but, yeah, uh, we are on the stars, you know Jimmy's Jimmy's so well read and he's a history major. And he sees, he sees a big picture that not everybody sees. And so he's, it's a joy to write together. I want to touch on real briefly this, uh, this documentary that's out. Anybody can watch it on, uh, streaming on Amazon. And it's called Jazz Fest, a New Orleans story. You have a great song. I've always enjoyed it. Blame it on New Orleans. You being so close there in Mississippi to to New Orleans, has that always been a special place for you? Well, you know, my vantage point on New Orleans, because I'm I'm from the very northeast corner of Mississippi. So uh, although it's, it's re- relatively close to New Orleans, it's as far in Mississippi as you can get from New Orleans. And Jimmy jokes about us being, you know, the uh, Bible Belt, The as, as he said, he was from the fun half of Mississippi down next to the salt water. <laughs> but I, and I'm, I'm very fond of where I grew up, but in, in my show, I always bring up that we tend to, in North Mississippi, we tend to blame everything generally on the devil and specifically on New Orleans. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I grew up hearing stories about people, you know, going crazy or, you know, going off like a Roman candle when they went for a weekend to New Orleans. And it was, it was our version of Sin City, I guess, uh, as opposed to, <laughs> going to Las Vegas, which we weren't really going to do. But I never went to New Orleans until I had a record deal at like 19 years old. I got I got carried down there. We did some radio tour, and I didn't know anything about anything. And it was really until, until I wrote uh, – the first time I ever wrote with Jimmy, he asked me to come to New Orleans, and we would just hang there a couple of days and, and write songs. He, he was a fan of my first album and reached out and was very gracious. He's always been – a supporter and believed in what I was doing honestly way before I did. And so he's been a great friend over the years, but he, he was really my introduction to New Orleans. We, we wrote a song called when the coast is clear. And that was the first song that we ever wrote together. And he took me some places to eat and, and took me some places to listen to music and blame it on New Orleans is really a, a written apology for what for what Southern Baptist Mac McAnally incorrectly thought about New Orleans until <laughs> until Jimmy Buffett introduced me to it, you know. Well, you captured so much in that song from uh, references to Preservation Hall jazz band to you name it. Great great work there. Now, well, thank you. Yes, sir. Jimmy Buffett and Frank Marshall appeared on this jazz inspired NPR show that I've been a fan of for years, and it's occurred to me, and maybe this is going to seem like, wow, Paul is really spacey today, but Jimmy has interpreted a lot of songs that, you know, when you think about it, these are songs that Sinatra recorded. Stars Fell on Alabama. Oh, yeah. Right. Slow Boat to China, etc. Mm-hmm. Could you ever see him doing something like that in terms of an album, like a, a vocal jazz album? Absolutely. And, he, you know, he, he's, it's not something he touts about himself, but he, he, he knows, he knows a great deal of the American songbook. You know, a lot of times when, 
we're at a restaurant and and uh, and it can just be music of some of the classic songs and he'll just start singing. He knows that stuff, and more more so than I do because I I, I, I grew up. My family was in gospel music. My mom was a piano player, so a lot a lot of the American songbook. I've learned just out of curiosity as a as a near senior citizen or, or post senior citizen, whatever it is I am. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he, he knows a lot of that stuff, and it's important to him. He loves singing it. I could really I could see him doing a whole album of it. And so so far, it's just amounted to pulling out a song every once in a while. But uh, I, I I would love for him to do a project of it because we have a band that's pretty much capable of any genre you want to point the the campus at very interesting so in closing here i want everybody go to mac mcanally.com you're going to see a lot of tour dates with jimmy buffett and the coral reefer band and then you're also going to see some some solo shows everywhere from avalon new jersey boston massachusetts atlanta georgia decatur alabama chicago illinois there there's Really a good variety of places, and it would be worth getting in your car and traveling a little to see him, as I might do. So uh, I always like to let the guest have the last word. For anyone who's tuned in with us, we just never know where or when they hear it. What would you say to anybody out there? Well, I would say, uh, and I say it every time we get to be on stage this year, on behalf of me and my second family, which the Coral Reefers are, how much it means to be back playing music with people for people again after the pandemic. It's not something, honestly, it's not something I ever took for granted, but after the last two years, I treasure it more than at any point in my life. It's such a joy to do. I mean, I I realize that at least in my own case, I'm a one trick pony. I have one thing that I can do halfway decent and I get to do that and call it a job in front of wonderful fan base that Jimmy has accumulated. And I'm so grateful, so blessed for that. I saw my one thing to say would, would be thanks for letting us do, in my case, the, the only thing I can do. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're too humble. Well, Mac McAnally, thank you so much for spending time with us. As always, I always love talking to you. And everybody, again, it's MacMcAnally.com. And thank you for... Uh, answering my very, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, frenetic questions today. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if either one of us finds the Elvis demo of Margaritaville, I expect a phone call, all right, Paul? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I've got people working on it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a cassette out there somewhere, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, sir. Well, until next time. Have a great one. You too. Godspeed. As well. Bye-bye. Thank you for stopping by today. If you enjoyed our program, consider telling a friend about it. The Paul Leslie Hour is made possible through people just like you. So you want to keep the show going, right? Go to thepaulleslie.com. That's thepaulleslie.com. Click on Support the Show. And thanks to everyone who contributes. Performance of the intro music is courtesy of John Primerano, The Entertainer, written by Scott Joplin. End credit theme music is courtesy of John Primerano, the traditional song, Corina, Corina. Your announcer is Dan Gold. Hey, that's me. The show is hosted and produced by Paul Leslie. And we'll see you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.